Welcome to Tracing Your Family Roots. I'm Chuck Mason and with me today is my co-host Janelle Blue. Janelle is president of the Mount Vernon Genealogical Society and she recently returned from Poland where she had some success finding her ancestors. Uh, it's probably like many of us, we'd like to know more about those European ancestors. I know before I got into genealogy, I went to Scotland and I wanted to know more, but I didn't know how to do research or anything else, so I wasn't all that successful. So how did you make the leap across the ocean to do the research and what caused you to decide to do this now? Well, thank you, Chuck. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to have a chance to be able to talk about this because it was quite exciting. Um, so I started out with very little information, but as we've talked about in many of these other sessions, you really need to do all of the work at home first, all of the US work that you can to try to know who those other um, relatives are and to get as much information as possible. The family story was that my great-great-grandparents, and we're gonna put a picture of them up, uh, Samuel Wyman and Louisa Pelchin were from Munich. And I wanted to be able to find something that would validate that, that would verify that and corroborate, and I was never able to do that um, with anything that I had found in the U.S. And, um, and so I, you know, there were church records. I went back to the original uh, evangelical church records that were available. Um, they had been moved to St. Louis, but I went back there and looked at them to see if there was anything in the margins that, you know, might tell me where they came from. Um, I went online uh, to, to put in uh, Samuel Wyman, nothing came up. And then I thought, well, I'm going to put in Louisa Pilchin. And in family search, it mir miraculously appeared <laughs> under Pelchin, but it didn't under Wyman. Just, just to clarify, uh, in case people don't know what family search is, family search is the website for the family history library out in Salt Lake. So just wanted yes. to make sure everybody knew. Yeah, and it's a very valuable uh, website, too. They've got a lot of this international information on there too. So, so there I found baptism records of the children of Louisa and Samuel, but not all of them, just a few. Yeah. But of those three or four that I found, um, it said that they were from Brett's. So I looked up Brett's and I found that that was located in Poland, in the Posen, or now it's referred to as Poznan um, section of Poland. Uh, well, that's a long way from <laughs> Munich. And, and so I thought, hmm, you know, this, this, uh, this may be it, but all those family trees that we have uh, on, on uh, ancestry, you know, they all say Munich. So I'm, I'm out to try to prove that. <laughs> well, one, one of the things that people may not be aware, Germany claimed so much of many portions of other countries that that we think of Germany as it is today, but in the 1800s it claimed a lot or a portion of a lot of the other countries in Europe. So it's easy to understand how these things can get confusing when you realize that. Yes, and in fact, you know, when my relatives were there, Poland was divided up between Russia, Prussia, and Austria, yeah. and so, but. But my, my folks lived in that area. Now, what you see on the screen is a family group um, picture. And I, w this is a very important step in trying to do anything. Before you go across the sea, you need to make sure you have this kind of thing. And it's probably not, it's probably hard for you to read. And it doesn't mean as much. But I think what's important is the first two daughters, it says the location is unknown where they were born. And they were they didn't show up in that um, microfilm that I that was digitized on Family Search. The other thing that was not didn't show up was the marriage record of Samuel and Louisa. And so, you know that that was uh, where you know where would that be? 
So um, I looked. I looked at land records, I looked at wills, I looked at newspapers, I looked everywhere to see if there was some indication of where they came from well, in, the, in the U.S. records. Probably one of the disadvantages you had with newspapers was were they in English or were they in Polish? <laughs> well, these were Germans, so, okay, they, German. so they were okay. in German community in, in Texas, is, but that was still a problem for me because especially, <laughs> you know, some of the old German is difficult to yeah. read. And, and so I really didn't, I wasn't really able to look at any of the old German newspapers, uh, newspapers. and th there might have been something in there, but I, I, I wasn't able to do that. The English ones didn't tell me anything yeah. except who voted Democrat or who, you know, that, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And there were some tax records, but they never said where they went. Now the census did, there was one census where my great grandfather, who, by the way, when, when Samuel and Louisa immigrated, he was a baby. Okay. So, so later on when he filled out the census, then he, there was one year when he said Posen rather than Germany. Most of the time, and I'm sure everybody who's who's watching this um, knows that you know it's usually a generic place like Germany or Scotland or someplace like that, and that's not very helpful. And and so if you had that answer, mm -hmm. why didn't you just stop there? Well, <laughs> um, glad you asked that question. Um, G it, it, Chuck, as you know, is a, is a certified genealogist that you can't just rely on one piece of information, that you've got to be able to, um, you, you've got to be able to corroborate that in some way. You've got to have multiple things that all point to that one thing. And of course, this Munich thing was just nagging at me. I, you know, that I still think there's, there's validity in family lore somewhere. Yes. And um, whether it, really turns out to be that or not, I don't know what I need, needed to feel like I needed to investigate. Oh, and I think, you know, sometimes we mm -hmm. have different people who will give different answers, too, yeah. depending <laughs> on what they know about the family when they answer the questions. And so, you know, we, I always say, particularly with census, you need to investigate everything because you never know which of the multiple answers you may find is going to be the correct answer. You really can't rely on one of them to be the answer. That's right, and I, I never could find a ship's register, so I, I don't really know. I mean, I only know that they immigrated don't, in. It. Don't feel alone. I have <laughs> s several ancestors supposedly come came over from Germany. I have one great-grandfather consistently says he came in in 1880. I can't find a thing for him. Well, I, you know, I don't know that supposedly there was a hurricane in Texas and, you know, the place where the records were, I don't know, who knows. <laughs> but anyway, the, I couldn't find them and, I, and so I don't really know who they immigrated with. I mean, later I'm going to tell you that I now know a little <laughs> bit more, but uh, at the time I, I didn't really know of anybody else. So um, that, that was a problem. Um, and, you know, the, the naturalization thing just said Germany uh, on my great-grandfather. So I, I, just didn't, I just didn't have anything that would point to anything other than Germany except for this Brits thing. And so I thought, it's time. It's time to go to Brits. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I wanted to go to see where they lived. I wanted to know more about what was going on when they were living there, what life was like. And if I was l so lucky that there was an archive there that w might have some information, I wanted to go there. So here's my choices. I could write to, I could, you know, sort of look for an archive. And all of this stuff is going to be in either Polish or German. German. And, um, and find one and write to them. Maybe some nice person would actually write it in Polish for me. Um, and then just hope that there's a nice person on the other end who would, who would do some research for me. So I could do that. Or I could hire somebody in country and give them all the information. Or I could go myself so. and, um, and engage that in-house, in-country person 
to work with me because I don't speak any Polish, never will be able to. It's a very <laughs> difficult language to master. I know very little German. And so the idea of being able to navigate with, um, you know, archives and, and, uh, and all of that, would, I mean, it was, it was just That's difficult to, organi uh, to, to navigate the inter, their, well, their Autobahns, actually. Yeah, some, sometimes <clears throat> it's difficult if they speak English. I can imagine with, with the language and, and, you know, different scripts. I know from, from someone that I know that reads the different scripts. Unfortunately, she's not still in this area. But, you know, it can be difficult with, with uh, German language and trying to understand the records and understand the people and what they're saying. Yeah. So. So, so the next thing was, how do you find a researcher? You know, that, that's sort of the $64 question. And I really ask around a lot. When I'd go to conferences, um, you know, I'd ask people who specialized in Germany or whatever. And, um, and I also went online because there's two certification bodies. There's one that's called ICAP-GEN, and you know what that stands yes. for. Yes, International Commission for the Accreditation of Professional Genealogists. Well done, <laughs> well done. And then there's the Board for Certification of, of Genealogists. Genealogist. And so the ICAP-GEN um, really specializes more in the international National. stuff. So, but each one of those has a, a place where their members can list if they're interested in taking clients. And they usually will say what areas they specialize in. Yeah. So I did look at that, and but then it was difficult to decide. You know, n nobody was specific to Posen, so then you don't know for sure, sure. who who really has that well, background. The the one good thing about both organizations is there is a testing program mm -hmm. that they go through before they they are accredited or, or certified by the organization. So that you at least have something there, and they mm -hmm. do have, if you have a dispute, they do have arbitration boards, but that's a lot better than just going on the internet and finding somebody in a country, because I know a couple of people that have done that and not had good experiences. So. Yeah, and there are, if you go Google, um, it, Posen and tours, you are going to find people who advertise that they'll help you with your ancestors and they take your, you know, they're going to do a tour. But so I, I, at one of the sessions that I went to at one of the programs, there was a woman there who was um, specializing in Eastern European. And so I asked her uh, for a referral. And I wound up with uh, Tadeusz Piwat. Uh, that's the Polish pronunciation. Um, and he also thankfully goes by Teddy. <laughs> <laughs> so I engaged Teddy and I was very specific about what I wanted to do. I wanted to do what I mentioned before. I wanted to go to Brits. I wanted to find the property that my, if my family, I didn't even know for sure if my family owned property or they rented, but I wanted to see where they lived. I wanted to know more about the culture and what was going on in the, in the town at the time and then whatever archives we could find. He wanted, in order to prepare for this, he wanted that family group sheet that I put up earlier. I sent him links to all of the documents that I had found online, which were really not that many, but those are the ones, and they were in German. So this was, and he spoke German, Polish, and also read it. So I knew I was in good hands, and he was um, great about setting it up so that when we actually got to Poland, we had a plan. We had a research plan. We knew where we were going. We knew what we were going to look for, and, um, and we knew the, the times that they opened and closed. And, we, yeah. and, so that, and of course, that's one of the main rules if you're going to do any kind of research. research. Yes. Yeah, it's important that preparation is important. Even if you're going downtown to the National Archives or the Library of Congress here, that knowing and preparing for it is mm -hmm. going to make a more successful trip. I have a map that we're going to put up in a minute just to kind of show you where Posen or Poznan is now the, the Polish term is located and where I was, um, that little red 
uh, indicator was where Brits is located. And you can kind of see where we are in relation to Gdansk is up in the north and uh, Krakow is down at the bottom. And, and then to the left of that is um, Germany. And so you can see how close that river th that you see is really the German border. So that shows you that it's really very likely that there was uh, somebody that was crossing back and it was pretty forth. easy to cross yeah. back and forth there. So, and we stayed in Poznan, which was the largest city because the uh, accommodations in these small villages was pretty grim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, so we, um, Bratz was about 89 kilometers from the large city that we stayed in. So that meant that we had to get up early and, um, and I had rented a car and uh, Teddy had a GPS, which was of course in Polish, so it was good that yeah. it was his GPS. And, and so we were able to pretty much navigate uh, to get there and because this, this archive closed at three o'clock. Yeah. And by the time you get there, get settled in, we, we, they had, this was a, a relatively new one. I think I've got a picture of it, there we go. Um, and luckily, this was a relatively new uh, facility, and which meant that they had some form of air conditioning. Ah. And during the trip, I had done other research in other parts, and some of those didn't have air conditioning, which is really amazing because they had some fabulous documents in there, and I don't know exactly how they've continued to be preserved, but, but this facility was new. So, it had air conditioning, it had a nice place for us to work, and um, they had computers with their database in there and um, lots of indexes, so we went immediately to that to, to look for some documents. There were different kinds of documents, and we wanted to look at the land records first. So we you know, went to that, whatever that was called, and I put that in came up with, there we go. Uh, well, actually, yeah, that's the first land record that we found um, after doing the index and pulling it to, uh, to the time frame we were looking for. And then my ancestor's name was actually on that. Um, and you can't see it very well, but Samuel Wyman's name is, is one of those names listed on that. That book was like a deed book for okay. a particular piece of property. And it, all the list of all those names are the owners from, oh. from the time when it started, when this book started, okay. which was 1826, down to 1889, I believe. Okay. Um, now, somebody might have owned that land earlier than that, but it was in a different book. book. And, um, but, but I there found my Samuel Wyman. It recorded that Samuel Wyman, who came from Wilkow, or that may not be the right pronunciation, but that's the way it's spelled, spelled, was buying property in 1843. He was a Maurer, which was a brick mason. That okay. was new information to me. To you. Yeah. But there it told me where he came from. And that explained why his two daughters never showed up in the Brett's church record. Records. And why possibly why there was no German, no, no marriage record that showed up. Um, so I was thrilled <laughs> to get that right off the, uh, at the beginning. Um, so that answered one of my genealogical questions. The problem is that wasn't Munich. <laughs> <laughs> so after that we went, oh, and there's, there's the researcher, there's Teddy. And those are the, the gloves that they gave us um, to when we were going through those original records. Um, no. And that was the little room that we are, were working in. Are they in. a cloth glove like the white gloves that no, we find here? No, these were actually um, some kind of a, a rubber or plastic rubber. or that's, something. That's, I thought they might look like they could be a rubber or mm -hmm. something. But. Yeah. So anyway, they, so we had to use those. Now, there's a, another archive that I went to in Poland. We didn't, but this one, I think, was smart to do that. Okay, so then we went to um, the next place. The next book that we found was the sort of the city register, the magistrate's mm. register. 
And there uh, I found some immigration information. And I figured, you know, they must need to have some kind of authorization to leave, to get a passport or maybe military. You know, they had to show that they had yeah, some ability to leave. I know at one point they definitely had to have permission because I did work for a client years ago where they were trying to find where the family came over. And the boys, the oldest two sons, were approaching the age where they would be drafted in to the military. And when I actually found the passenger, the ship's passenger list, the ages were a year older than, than the client thought they were. And instead of being Christian, the oldest person or child on the list was listed as Christina, a female. <laughs> so we speculated that they actually snuck him out of Germany because uh, he was 18 oh, according yeah. to the passenger list, uh -huh. not 17 as the client thought. Uh -huh. But I know there, there was a, a permission they had to get at that point, this was the 1870s, because otherwise they wouldn't have let him go Right. They'd have drafted him into the military. So. Well, what I'm doing now is having all of those, and the, the pages, there's, a, there's an example of, of that, that, what was in that book. And there were several pages of that because it was not just my ancestor who was asking for immigration. There was like five or six different men, men's men. names. Okay and their families who wanted to leave. And so this was dealing with that group all at the same time. And, um, and so, and by the way, one of those people, I, I found them in, in that church book in Texas. Okay. And so I, I actually know that those okay. two families immig immigrated together. Okay. Um, but anyway, there were so many pages and so much information that we, we certainly scanned it while we were sitting there and we took pictures, but we're now, I'm now having it, first of all, uh, tr um, um, transcribed in the German transcribed, and then we're gonna translate it into English. English. And hopefully we will be able to talk to somebody who can tell me about the terms sort of the terms that were used in those documents to see how, what they meant in those days, yeah. because there may be something. Anyway, my family, um, I think one of the pictures um, actually showed that it listed all of the names of the children that okay. were going. It also, again, it identified him as a Maurer uh, with the Brook Mason. Um, it also gave his date of birth. It gave the date of birth of all the men, only the men. Only the men. Okay. And, um, and I think that's because of the military requirement. Right, right. Um, and they did deal with, for instance, this other fellow who, who came to Texas at the same time. They talked about his military service. But my ancestor was all, my great-great-grandfather was already in his 50s mm. by the time he immigrated. immigrated. And my great-grandfather was just born that same year. So there was really no reason to talk about military. Right. Plus he wasn't even from that area. So, um, but they did say that these people were eligible to immigrate because there were no outstanding debts. Um, and by the way, when, when I went back to the land record, the land record s said how much he paid for that land, which, which blocks it was, um, and there were intervening transactions that took place. So I don't know if there was debt on there or not, but mm -hmm. um, we'll find out when the thing gets translated. Sure. But anyway, all that got cleared up. He sold the property the same year that he then applied for immigration. So they were approved and this document had all of that in there. It was just a wealth of information. Um, and I, Someday, I want to go look at those other names that are um, associated with that to see um, whatever happened to them. I know the one, the, uh, the one that shows up in the church book, but I don't know about the rest of the people. It's mm -hmm. very possible. So what do I need to do now? You know, I, I've, um, oh, one other thing we did was we went, so when we went to Brett's, we actually drove to Brett's. It's sort of a village. Um, and there was a big church there. 
and it was a Catholic, there we go, it's a Catholic church now. But we, we went to, we knocked on the door of the priest and said, you know, can you tell us about this? No, he had just gotten there uh, only a few weeks earlier, but there was someone else who might be able to, and they would also let us in to, to tour the church. So we, we did that. Um, there's a picture of the inside a little bit that shows um, really almost the only thing they said that was probably original from the evangelical days was this, um, the altar. Mm -hmm. They thought that that was still, and there were also, there was wood under all of the pews, which I, I didn't share a picture of that, um, whereas all the rest of the floor was tile. So they said that that would have been original. But the one thing that was really exciting was that they invited us to go up into the bell tower. Bell tower. And that was quite an adventure because it was pretty rickety and it was a long, many, many stairs up. Um, but when we got there, um, yeah, Teddy yeah. took a look at the, all the inscriptions that were uh, in, molded into the, the bell and the date on that was 1843. That's the year my ancestors came. Actually, it was 1842. I'm not sure if that's when the bell was made exactly, yeah. but that tells me, that tells me that my ancestors were there. Yeah. And yeah. just on a hypothesis, why were they there? Mm. Maybe he was a brick mason. That, that church was being built about that time. Yeah. It's a brick church. It's a stone foundation. Maybe he went for that. It's been an interesting story, and we've run out of time. Oh, no. But <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the moral. Your research journey is never done. No. There's always something, something new. More. Every answer brings and, another question. And you had success with the trip. I had a lot of success, and I plan to go back. Good.